So my name is Bana Heinsen with the Cook County Farm Bureau, and I'm here with Tim Stunkel, who is one of our current board members and a longtime volunteer with the Cook County Farm Bureau. And Tim, if you can take a minute and just introduce yourself and introduce really your family's role with Cook County Farm Bureau, because I know yourself and your sisters and your parents before you were heavily involved in the Farm Bureau. Yes, uh, my name is Tim Stunkel. I'm a current board member of Cook County Farm Bureau. I'm entering my, I guess, sixth or seventh year now on the board. Um, <clears throat> I currently serve as the Ag Lit uh, Chairman, and uh, I've been on the Ag Literacy Committee as a volunteer for probably 13, 14 years, something like that. But uh, I grew up with Cook County Farm Bureau. Uh, my parents got involved in the mid 80s. I think my mom probably joined in 1984 as women's committee and an ag in the classroom presenter. And I think my dad joined the board in 1986. So since I was a young kid, Cook County Farm Bureau and Farm Bureau talk in general is a part of our daily life, dinner, dinner table talk, if you will. Um, our family farms has farmed in Southern Cook County for about 150 years, since about 1860. And I'm a sixth generation farmer. Right now, I, I farm part-time in, in Southern Cook County and Will County, and uh, I also work full-time in the industry as a marketing director for a company that manufactures spare products and precision farming equipment up in the West suburbs. So I, I'm, I'm working in two different roles, both related to agriculture, and I, you know, I studied agriculture in college, and I've always been an ag person. Um, Tim, you brought up that your family has been involved in Farm Bureau and that Farm Bureau was kind of a dinner time conversation. What really is your earliest memory with Cook County Farm Bureau? I would say my earliest memory was my mom being Ag in the Classroom instructor, taking my Ertl Farm toys with her to go present, <laughs> always warning her not to get them scratched or dented or dinged while they were being handed around the room. So that was probably my earliest memory of that was, you know, surrendering my toys for the sake of education, which I did reluctantly. And just mom talking about presentations and having the videos and grain samples and all sorts of stuff at the house. And um, so, yeah, that's probably where it first goes back to. Um, my kids have given me the same lecture when I take theirs to AFBF for our booths. Bring them back, make sure I get my toys back. Um, you brought up briefly your dad was a longtime board member, um, and he was a past president as well, correct? Correct, for three years, yep. Three years. And I, I, my memory with your dad is limited, obviously, but I remember him being heavily involved with Food Checkout Day. I remember him being involved with egg, ed, egg education as well. What else was your father involved with? I believe during his tenure as president, we also split into the new team structure, the five team or four team at that time, now five, five team structure, where we kind of reorganized the committees into the basic you know, commodities marketing, member relations, PR and, and uh, ag literacy, you know, public policy. So that was part of it. But he was he was a big fan of the Ronald McDonald program and working with those guys and that, you know, the whole food checkout day and all that. He was pretty, pretty, uh, pretty pro on that. Um, I would have to go back through agendas, but I believe your dad was involved with every food checkout day that we held once. So food checkout day was created in 01 um, with Ronald McDonald. And as you know, especially we've stepped away from the partnership with Ronald McDonald and have altered food checkout day just in light of the changes um, with their meal delivery and our goals with food checkout day. But I believe your dad was involved in every single one since it was created. I guess I didn't realize that. I, if he missed, I believe it was very few. Um, your mom, you brought up that she was involved with the women's committee and was a egg literacy presenter. How were the presentations different then compared to our um, having the individuals present now? Well, I have to presume. Obviously, it was much more you know in person. There was there was no PowerPoint. There was no hardly any. There was no internet really at that time in, in that domain. So it was much more. One-on-one, -on -one, obviously, um, presenters were probably a little bit more formal at the time. It was probably more people with farm backgrounds, farm moms versus people with educational backgrounds. But it was, yeah, it was probably very hands-on. Obviously, today things have evolved, particularly in the last year with COVID, and uh, it's 
pretty impressive how effectively the folks have adapted and gotten very, very positive results in the last 12 months. Absolutely. And COVID's part of the reason we're having the conversation through Zoom as opposed to sitting down and talking in person. Um, during your time as a board member, what instances stand out? What are you most proud of that Farm Bureau has done that the teams have done? Certainly in the last 12 months, just the, the adaptation to COVID has obviously been important, but you know, obviously we've all done that. Um, I think just the ongoing tenacity of the board, obviously we have a lot of long-term people, but we've also brought a lot of new staff in in the last couple of years, which is good. Um, we've diversified the board a bit, I would say, compared to the past. Um, so just, and you know, it's, it's, it's been a tough ag economy out there for the last seven, eight years. So trying to maintain membership and relevance is always important. And the ag economy always adapts, it, it has to, otherwise it will die. Absolutely. Um, you brought up the adaptations in agriculture. Um, you are a sixth generation family farmer um, in a area that is becoming increasingly more heavily populated. What changes have you seen in your farm operation and your neighboring farms and the number of farmers? Good topic. Um, certainly, you know, I've we've seen the area of Southern Cook County agriculture evolve a lot certainly over my life alone, you know, growing up as a kid, you always thought, oh, suburbia is going to get us one of these days. And here we are 40 plus years later, and we're still alive and relatively strong. So we've, we've seen suburbia encroach on us about every 20 years, there's another wave. Um, yet it has not devoured us. And quite frankly, the farm keeps going on. So it's, it's a changing area for sure. Uh, it's become obviously much more more developed, more suburban. Um, and I went to high school that was a mile and a half away. That still is there. And we had 1,200 students. For two years, there was two farm kids. And for two years, there was one farm kid. And I was one of them for all four years. So we were not a rural area, despite being you know, a mile away, you were out in the country. So it's, uh, it's changed, but that's just the nature of suburbia. Um, and I'm proud we've been able to stay there as long as we have, and we continue to stay there. And we have ground we've owned there since about 1860. Um, so, you know, things change, but you adapt and you go with it. And uh, there's always opportunities to keep farming. And we're growing corn and beans. This isn't a specialty operation, it's just, you know, broad acre crops. But uh, there's challenges, but you live with them. Absolutely. Now, have you always grown corn and beans or did you have livestock at one point? Certainly growing up, my dad was primarily a hog farmer. So he, you know, my grandparents' generation was, of course, your standard diversified beef, cattle, dairy, chicken, oats, hay, corn thing. And then dad kind of the hog business in probably the early 60s. And we were here at a finished farm for up until I think 1998 when prices just fell apart and dad was able to pick up more ground do more real crop work and exited the hog business because it just didn't make profitable sense. I think that's the same year that we came out of hogs as well. Um, so I have to pick on you a little bit. Earlier when we started the 100 year interviews, um, a former member of the women's committee was talking about your mom's role in the women's committee and that how she ended up having to step away because of little Timmy Stunkel. <laughs> Um, the story you told me about, I believe it was the, um, was it a silo or a corn crib of that property um, out in Country Club Hills? I was wondering if you can just talk about the interconnections between, even though Cook County is so large and farmers are becoming fewer and far between, we still have some interconnections. And I just, that story stood out to me of how well connected agriculture still is and how much our farmers are still connected. And it, was that individual somehow related to you as well, distantly? Am I allowed to say her name or no? Yes, oh, of course. Well, Emily Stelter, of course, is a, just celebrated her birthday, what, a month or two ago? November. She's a trooper. You've known yeah, her since I was a kid. She was on women's committee with mom. Um, hell of a lady, cool, cool, cool person. 
So my grandmother was a sculptor. I'm not sure what the connection is there. I'm guessing there's probably some multi-generation connected between my grandmother and her family. But my grandmother was from Country Club Hills as well, like the Stelters. And uh, we actually have a corn crib on the farm, not in use anymore, but it was, so I was told back long before I was born and perhaps before dad was born, they took the thing apart into three pieces, hauled it from Country Club Hills to our farm in Madison on Sock Trail on flatbeds and rebuilt the thing. And it still stands today. <laughs> You couldn't really do that anymore, but yes, we have a building that was relocated from several miles away and it made good sense at the time to do that. Um, where exactly that was at, I'm not sure. Um, but uh, talking about the community, holy cow, yes, the ag community grown up, we were a mile and a half from the church, which was also our grade school. And many, many, many people got married with neighboring farmers, you know, one, two miles away. I think in grade school, I could almost trace half my class back to some sort of relationship, either through blood or through marriage. Um, so it was it was a little bit old school like that, but I can think of many, many people where you can say, oh yeah, your farm was a half mile this way, your farm was two miles that way. You guys dated each other across the field, met at church, got married, had kids. There's just a ton of that. You know, anytime, unfortunately, in this world, you go back to wakes and funerals instead, and you see all these people, and even 30, 40 years later, you're realizing, I didn't understand you were siblings or you were you know, relatives and stuff like that, but it's very, it's still very a tight-knit community, albeit evolving and spreading out, but there was a huge amount of neighbor-to-neighbor, church-to-church kind of connections. Absolutely. And I remember several years ago, we had a member who ended up with a tornado going through in November, I believe it was. And that same community right, rallied, went, helped him clean up, helped him pick items out of the field so he could continue harvesting. Um, the egg community, I mean, with everything that has happened, everything that's going on now, especially with COVID, it's incredible to see how it comes together regardless and is still there to support one another and help out. Um, it, just thinking about like your experience when your dad was on the board and everything, um, he was with during really a pivotal time when we transitioned the team structure and everything and leadership. Um, do you remember anything that he ever said about like outside of um, food checkout day, what he was proudest of with Farm Bureau? I think he was he was always an advocate for ag in the classroom. I think that was one of his hot button things. He just believed in it, the education, the outreach, um, reaching kids. So I think for sure he was definitely an advocate of that whole program. And obviously it was established and going on, but he was certainly a big believer in that. Absolutely. And I, I suspect part of that is his experience with your mom being a presenter and hearing her stories and seeing first ha firsthand the impact of it. Yep. That was probably part of what brought him onto the board, I'm guessing. So is that the same reason that you chose to be on Ag in the Classroom? Or how did you um, how did you find your way to the Farm Bureau as a volunteer first? And then how did you find your way to the Ag Literacy team? Uh, my Really, my first experience with volunteering was through Ag in the Classroom or the Ag Lit Committee. So that is how I got started officially. I mean, when I grew up going to the annual dinners and all those events. So I, you know, we knew a lot of the people on the board and members for many, many years. So it was very natural to get involved, but the Aglet team was what I think got my attention. That's how I first got started and did that for many years. Absolutely. Um, so Tim, as we start wrapping up, is there anything about your experience on the board that you wanna capture as we are um, beginning to put the finishing touches on our hundred year celebration? And I mean, you more than, most people, because of your involvement with the planning committee, know that we really got sidelined um, and our breakfast at the Farm Bureau really became a drive through, which was still incredible to see the number of people come out for. Um, but anything you want to capture? Anything less thoughts? Well, I'm, I'm a relatively new member to the board, so I, I guess I'm coming from the earlier perspective, but it's a great team to be a part of. It's ton of awesome people, a lot of characters, a lot of smart people, a lot of fun people. It's a good time. Um, I'm very 
proud to be associated with the group and to serve the organization. And 100 years is great. I'm glad we did that. I am I'm disappointed that we had COVID this year, but we still did it anyways. And uh, like I said, it's just, it's just a start. So uh, great organization to be part of. I hope to serve it well, and I look forward to another 100 years.